December 31, 2000, people from all over the globe are getting ready to ring in the new year. The first year of the new millennium has come to an end, and many are ready for new beginnings, fresh starts, and the exciting times that lie ahead. In the suburbs of western Tokyo, a woman is trying to contact her daughter, son-in-law, and grandchildren. Within just a few minutes, her world will come crashing down around her, and an investigation into one of Japan's most sinister and infamous murders will begin. Mikio Miyazawa and his wife Yusuko lived in the Kamasoshigaya neighborhood of Setagaya, Japan. He worked for a marketing company and she dedicated her life to teaching. The couple were devoted to one another and shared two children, Nina and Ray. Nina was a bright and clever young girl. The eight-year-old was a year ahead in school and had a passion for dance. Her grandmother Haruko said she loved ballet and would often showcase her talents to her family. Her little brother Ray was a six-year-old with a funny and inquisitive nature. He had special needs and required extra supports and he was adored by his family. Both children grew up surrounded by love and happiness. During the day on the 30th of December, the Miyazawa family, like many others, spent that day relaxing. They went shopping, and then after eating dinner, they settled in to watch a film. Family was everything to the Miyazawas, so much so that Yusuko's mother Haruko lived in a house not far from theirs. She adored her daughter and son-in-law and doted on her grandchildren. Most mornings, Haruko would call the home to check in with her family, and on the 31st of December, this is exactly what she did. Picking up the phone and dialing the number, something strange happened. The call wouldn't go through. The phone in the Miyazawa house had been disconnected. Haruko was immediately concerned. She went to the house but got no response. As her anxiety began to rise, she let herself into the home. Lying at the bottom of the stairs was the body of her son-in-law. He had been brutally stabbed to death. She then ran upstairs where she found her daughter and granddaughter. They too had been stabbed. As she searched the rest of the house, she found her beloved grandson in his bed. He had been strangled to death. Haruko's screams were apparently so loud, those in neighboring houses heard her cries. The police soon arrived on scene after the alarm was raised. Takeshi Tashida served as an officer for 41 years before his retirement. He was a chief officer at Seijo Police Station, and they were in charge of the investigation. He and his colleagues were determined to get justice for the slain family. Takeshi said that the scene was so traumatizing. The facial expressions of the family are still etched into his memory to this day. The news of the murders sent shockwaves throughout Japan. Murders of this nature are extremely rare, and people could not believe that a family could be murdered in their own home in the most horrific way. When Makio's mother Satsuko found out that they had been killed, she said she went into such a state of shock, she blanked out. The first thing they had to determine was a point of entry. How had the killer gained access to the house? At the back of the house to the Sashigaya Park, this gave the perpetrators of different places to enter the house from whilst remaining undetected. One theory that the police thought was most likely was that the killer had climbed a tree by the house and entered the second floor bathroom after removing the window screen. This is still, however, just a theory. The exact point of entry remains unknown. This was further complicated when Haruko initially told investigators she had used her spare key to let herself in, but then said she wasn't sure. As the door could have been unlocked, it was hard for detectives to determine exactly how the killer had gained entry. What is known is that the events that unfolded that night are nothing short of a nightmare. After entering Ray's room, the killer strangled the six-year-old with their bare hands. Ray's father had heard the commotion and ran upstairs to investigate. Mikio fought the intruder off with all of his might. He was able to injure the assailants, but the attacker was armed. Using his sashimi knife, he stabbed Mikio in the head. He stabbed him with such force the part of the blade broke off. The killer then moved through the house and attacked Yusuko and Nina with the broken blade before using his son Tokyo knife belonging to the family to stab the mother and daughter to death. The investigators believed that the killer carried on stabbing Yusuko and Nina even after they had died. Having just wiped out the Miyazawa family in the most brutal fashion, the killer did not leave. Police estimate that they remained inside the home for between two and ten hours. The intruder ate food from the fridge and drank tea. 
They used the family first aid kit to treat the wounds they had sustained from Mikio while attempting to fight them off. They used the family's computer to surf the internet at around 1.18 that morning, within just a few hours of annihilating an entire family. The internet was also turned on at around 10 a.m. on the morning Haruko discovered the bodies. Whilst this could have been the killer, it could also have been accidentally triggered by Haruko when she entered the home. The killer also took a nap on the sofa in the second floor living room, while the bodies of the Miyazawa family were scattered throughout the house. As the investigation got underway, police were able to determine several clues about the killer's identity. Before leaving the house, the killer not only left the knives used in the murder, but also several items of clothing. Investigators determined that the items had been bought in the Kanagawa prefecture. They discovered the sweater left behind was one of only 130 ever made. It was a rare piece of clothing that only a select few had. Despite this being a major lead, it would prove to be fruitless. Despite the best efforts of the police, they were only able to find 12 of the people who had bought one of the sweaters. Another item that was left in the house was a hit bag. During the analysis, trace amounts of sound were found inside. After extensive testing, the sound was determined to have originated in the Nevada desert, more precisely the area of Edwards Air Force Base in California. Crime scene examiners scoured the house and were able to find fingerprints and DNA belonging to the killer litter throughout. When they were put through Tokyo's police database, it came back with no matches. Either they had no criminal record, or they weren't a Japanese citizen. It was also revealed that the killer's blood was type A, which should not belong to the Miyazawa family. The blood revealed further clues about the murderer. It was revealed that the killer was male, possibly of mixed-race heritage. The killer's maternal DNA indicated his mother was of European descent, and his paternal DNA revealed a father of East Asian origin. The Y chromosome was scrutinized, and this showed the haplogroup OM122, common amongst people of East Asian heritage, present in 1 in 4 or 5 Koreans, 1 in 13 Japanese, and 1 in 10 Chinese people. With more evidence pointing to a possibly international killer, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police called upon the help of the International Criminal Police Organization, as the murderer could have left the country. When it came time for the funeral of the Miyazawa family, Setsuko Mikio's mother, said she was so traumatized that she cannot remember it. She was so stricken with grief that she had to be carried inside. The pressure was building on investigators to provide answers for the shattered family. The police released a mock-up of what the killer had possibly looked like and the clothes he would have been wearing. He was estimated to be around 5 foot 5 and of slim stature. They also believed he was between the ages of 15 and 35 due to the physical fitness it would have required to enter the home and commit the murders. The wounds sustained by the Miyazawa family also indicated that he was right-handed. The investigation into the Miyazawa family massacre became the center of national news, and many theories started to circulate. One theory was that Mikio had been seen arguing with youth skateboarding in the park near his home, as the clothes left the scene could indicate a skater. Maybe someone had had enough of Mikio's complaints about the noise and sought revenge. He wasn't just the police who were conducting investigations. An investigative journalist named Fumiya Ichihashi covered the case extensively. He wrote a book about it, and he argued that the murderer was a former soldier from a South Korean army who became a hitman. Ichihashi has said that the family was paid compensation when the park near the house had been expanded, and this was a motive for the killer. He has also said that as the killer left behind not only clothes and the murder weapons, but also DNA and fingerprints, he would have had to have been sure he wouldn't be apprehended. He also believes that the initial investigation was not enough. All the special investigators for the Tokyo Police Department were working on different cases, so the reserve team was used instead. And due to it being New Year's Eve, many investigators were at home with their families, so valuable time could have been lost when sending officers to the crime scene. Investigator Sashida has dismissed these claims, calling it nonsense. The investigation into the murders of the Miyazawa family became one of the biggest in Japanese history. Nearly 250,000 officers were involved and over 12,000 pieces of evidence were collected. Police scoured the local area with a fine-tooth comb. They interviewed friends and associates of the Miyazawa family to try and find a motive in this seemingly random case, but every lead would go nowhere. Despite the tireless efforts of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police, the countless hours spent investigating, and the very specific details they have been able to uncover about the killer, they have never been able to determine his identity, 
and he remains at large to this day. The detectives who worked on the Miyazawa case have since retired, but the investigators have never given up hope that the perpetrator of the Miyazawa family massacre would be brought to justice. As of 2019, there are 35 officers assigned to the case. There is a reward of 20 million yen for any information that could help solve the murders. Every year, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Force make a pilgrimage to the house to renew their promise that the killer will be caught. Manabu Ide works for the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Special Investigative Task Force. He has vowed to carry on until the killer has been captured and has said that his colleagues want to help the family rest in peace by finding their murderer. The house has stood empty since that fateful day, perfectly preserved. But due to its age, the police want to have it demolished. Superintendent E. Day has assured that all evidence from within the house is being preserved and tearing it down will not affect the investigation. Takeshi Tsushida, despite being retired, has never left the case behind. Even after his retirement, he made his own flyers to try and seek out new information and he still visits the crime scene regularly so as not to forget the details. He remains in close contact with Mikio's mother Satsuko. Satsuko has a shrine to her son, daughter-in-law, and grandchildren in her home, and whenever Toshida visits, he always prays at the shrine, promising the family he will never give up hope that they will have justice. Satsuko has the toys her grandchildren loved in a cabinet on display, she has said that her greatest regret was that she never got to see them grow up into the amazing adults they would have been. The impact of the murders is both far-reaching and irreparable. For those who investigated, they remain unable to forget the crime scene and will not move on until the killer is caught. Satsuko has said that she longs for the day she can go to the shrine in her home and tell her son, daughter-in-law and grandchildren that the person who took their lives in the most sadistic and brutal way possible has finally been caught. If you have any information relating to the murders of Mikio Miyazawa, Yasuko Miyazawa, Nina Miyazawa, and Rei Miyazawa, then please contact the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Force.